Good morning, everybody. My name is Yvette Petkovich. I'm a Florida licensed attorney, and I have been involved in cannabis education uh, for some time. I've been involved in, in cannabis and the law as well for some time, keeping in mind that officially it hasn't been legal uh, to its full capacity until very recently. And really, um, it's not 100% official because I, I, I suspect, as most of you know, um, the rules that are going to govern this area of law in the state of Florida will be written um, probably in about two months, if they haven't already been written already, but they'll become official um, sometime within the next six months. I've been asked to come up here and speak to you um, about something that over the last two years I became even more passionate about, and that is the role of doctors um, in this industry, and specifically how medical marijuana will affect a medical practice. I became even more passionate about this issue as it relates to doctors because I, I came to the big realization, and maybe it should have been more obvious, early on, but it wasn't, that at the end of the day, the success of this industry is largely contingent upon doctors and how they perform and how they um, not just interact with their patients, but how they accept this idea of social responsibility that will weigh on them um, doing this. I'm pretty convinced that doctors are the gatekeepers to this industry, because number one, they are going to pretty much govern, not so much govern, but determine the demand for this. And the demand will ultimately determine what a lot of people are very interested in that are not patients, which is the business aspect of it. Um, as you all know, uh, Florida is fairly conservative on this issue, and it's going to require a lot of nudging and a lot of advocacy um, to push this in the direction that I suspect most of you in this room want it to go. As a bit of an aside, um, I actually ran for office this past cycle, um, November 8th, and while I wasn't successful in my run, um, I feel pretty good about what we did. But the reason why I bring it up is because I got very involved in the Amendment 2 movement the first time around, and it really motivated me to run for office because I saw, and I saw firsthand, not just because I traveled to Tallahassee and I was present at the workshops and I had my finger on this, on the button of this constantly, but how politicized Florida is on this issue. And so I mentioned that tying it back to this idea of social responsibility and activism and advocacy in this arena. So. I already explained to you why doctors are so crucial, right? They'll determine eventually how many dispensaries are going to be opened, I suspect, because as we know, Tallahassee will probably try to limit it to some degree. And the more patients um, become eligible, the more dispensaries we are going to need. Remember that um, from a constitutional law perspective, the access of patients to this medication will be in large part the main argument if Tallahassee doesn't move this in the direction that we want it to move. So doctors must be well equipped to order this medication, all right? And so how will a medical practice be affected by this? Um, I would say in two large ways. The first one, I think Dr. Wiener talked about it, is education, right? Sadly, this medicine has not really been mainstream ever until, I, I would argue it's still not mainstream. Medical schools are not teaching it. Um, and while there are some major organizations that have offered conferences and, and guidelines on all of this, for the most part, it's incredibly new. Doctors have to get educated on this to the best extent that they can. The second way that they will be, that a practice will be affected by this is the idea that a doctor will be under greater scrutiny than they have ever been before. And they have to be okay with that. They have to embrace that. And in fact, a lot of what I um, counsel my clients in is 
you almost have to self-regulate and to some degree almost go above and beyond whatever the law requires. And the reason why I say that is because it's one thing for an investigator from the Department of Health to walk into the office, right, and ask to see the following five files, right, and for them to open it and go through it and, and pretty much audit it, right? And it, it, I, I always tell my clients it's an incredible idea to put certain protocols and procedures in place that even go above and beyond what the law is. That way, if this process happens to you where you have investigators looking at your files, you can say, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. Okay, the law says X, right? Which in large part, as it relates to what the law says right now, it's really very vague, okay? Um, we have two pieces of legislation that we can kind of rely on to get an idea as to what's gonna be required, and I'm referring to the low THC bill that was passed in 2014 and then the Right to Try Act, which was passed, I believe it was last session. Um, There's some basic requirements um, in both of those that involve, you know, obviously consent forms and the actual law lays out some of the things that should be on those consent forms. Um, you know, there's, there's a host of other requirements, but as it relates to how your file should look, doctors really should take the best measures possible to almost stretch it a little bit more so that you can say, you know what, not only do I do this, but I likewise do this. I'm going to give you an easy example on that. I always advise my doctors that what they should be doing is creating a training program within their office. Even if their office is three people, it doesn't matter, okay? Um, whenever a doctor attends a conference, they should bring their, their office administrators along. Okay, so instituting these, you know, inner office protocols, right, not only will they make you better in terms of a practitioner and in the business of the practice, but also what you're essentially doing is creating a track record of all the things that you're doing to assure that you're being compliant. And heaven forbid, down the road, you get slapped with, you know, some sort of administrative complaint from the Department of Health, you're going to come to me to defend you on those administrative complaints, and I'm gonna have a host of arguments as to why they shouldn't find probable cause that you've committed X violation. Um, and to some degree, it's, it's almost, I don't wanna say that simple, um, but it's, it's hard sometimes as a doctor. You know, I, I, I strongly believe that oftentimes doctors want to be doctors and not necessarily business people. It, it's, it's almost the same thing that lawyers suffer from at times. But at the end of the day, in this type of business, um, you know, it's incredibly crucial um, to institute these practices in your, in your firm. I'm sorry, in your, in your practices. Something else that I want to talk about that I think has a lot to do with how the practice will be affected by this is something specific in um, the amendment, okay? I'm sure most of you already know Amendment 2 and the language of Amendment 2. You can Google it. It's incredibly simple to find. Basically, under Amendment 2, there were 10 conditions that were automatic. Your patient has that condition. They're eligible. Now, of course, remember that you need to treat the patient for 90 days before you make um, a particular recommendation, and then every 45 days you need to revisit um, your, your determination and almost and reevaluate and then reorder it for the patient. Um, but I think something that will largely govern the success or determine the success of this industry will be how the legislature the Department of Health, Florida Medical Association, determines the following. There's 10 conditions, but then there's this sort of catch-all, right? Which basically says that a, if a doctor, a doctor has to certify that whatever the patient has if, is of the same kind or class as comparable to any of the other 10 conditions. In other words, the 10 conditions uh, approximately AIDS, HIV, cancer, epilepsy, glaucoma, MS, Crohn's, Parkinson's, PTSD, and I'm missing one. The doctor has to be able to put in their charts 
okay, that what their patient has is of the same kind or class as comparable to one of those other conditions. What does that mean? <laughs> um, I'll give you my take on this. I have some doctors, right, that will maybe say, that will look at it and say, oh, well, my patient has maybe one condition that's similar to Crohn's disease, right? And they'll say, all right, I'm going to recommend it. Uh, slow down. Slow down. All right? There is really no guidance right now on what that means. And there's something really important that's going to go on, obviously, in the next six months. But one of, the, you know, one of those things that are incredibly, incredibly important is how this particular um, language is defined. There is a proposed rule right now um, where the FMA, the Florida Medical Association, is to define what this means. Me personally, I don't think that that's a good thing that the FMA gets involved in this. The FMA has been um, very conservative. Um, you know, they are doctor's advocates. They're not patient advocates. And that really affects, I think, how they approach all of this. Um, I think their approach will be incredibly conservative because they want to protect their doctors as opposed to being a little bit more open to service the patient. Um, this is a huge point of contention among a lot of my clients and what that means. Um, and what I always explain to the client on this, again, we'll have direction, I think, um, in the coming months. But right now, what I would encourage any doctors to do is digest, understand, educate themselves, do everything possible to understand and, and know these 10 conditions, all right? Because at the end of the day, what's going to happen is that doctors um, in their famous chicken scratch, right, they're going to have to create these very detailed um, charts right? Um, knowing that eventually these charts are going to get audited and they're going to get looked at. And so at the end of the day, I, I suspect that I don't think it's going to be as easy as saying, oh, it's one, con you know, one condition, or I'm sorry, one symptom is like Parkinson's and therefore they're eligible. You know, I don't think so. And I know that a lot of people don't want to hear that, um, but I just know the culture of Tallahassee and how they're approaching this. And the reality is, they're incredibly conservative. And so we'll have to wait and see what that means, but doctors are really going to have to educate themselves on these conditions so that they can find those comparisons and articulate them. And I would even encourage you to, in your charts, and I know this is pretty much out of the ordinary, but you should reference in your charts sources where you are obtaining this information. Okay, it's just a better way to back yourself up. It's a better way to put me or whatever other attorney or yourself, some doctors want to handle it themselves, in the best position possible to justify what it is that you all are doing. I want to talk a little bit about some of the, you know, general requirements or rules that you can expect um, that you're, you can expect will, will, will happen. Um, in the next couple of months. I always explain to people that the likelihood that Tallahassee will, um, the likelihood that they will walk away from the format, from the rules and the regulations that they spent two years creating, the likelihood that they'll completely walk away from that is very slim, okay? And that's to some degree a little bit of bad news because, um, I'll give you an example. This idea that every 45 days you have to see that patient again, reevaluate them in order to submit a new order, it's pretty onerous when you think about it. Um, I know that Dr. Weiner spoke a little bit about telemedicine. That's, that's a big topic right now because through telemedicine, you're kind of alleviating some of that burden. At the same time, you know, at the same time, remember I spoke a little, I, I made a comment about social responsibility, right, when I started speaking. 
at the same time, the problem with telemedicine is that you are exposing yourself to criticism and potentially um, not being socially responsible, okay? And so I only make that, listen, I'm not a doctor, so I can't speak to the, you know, the day-to-day -day and, and what, you know, the typical experience of a doctor is, um, you know, but these are some of the things that are going to get hashed out over the next um, couple of months. Another requirement is this whole 90-day thing, right? The 90-day thing is that a doctor has to, um, I'm sorry, a patient has to be under the treatment of a doctor for 90 days, right? Well, I get a lot of questions about, well, what if it's an old patient and I've had them for three years? Well, the law doesn't really speak specifically to that. But um, what I advise um, my clients on and what I suspect will be clarified more over the next um, couple of months is that if you've been treating them for three years, you have plenty of med medical records to substantiate uh, your diagnosis and your ultimate recommendation. And those are easier, you know, those are easier. Um, but when you get a new patient, right, and you have to see them for 90 days, well, let's talk about that. So I have some, uh, I have some clients that want to see them on the first day and want to see them on the 90th day. And what I tell them is negative. Don't do that. Okay? You got to see them at least once a month for the next 90 days, if not more. And the only reason why I say that is because at the end of the day, what you don't want to do is create a practice that comes across as though all you are is a conduit for an order that the, every single patient is going to get at some point. And how, how, is that, um, how is that determination made by the regulatory bodies? It's made through your, through your records, through your files, right? And if there's certain patterns that get created consistently and that, that becomes problematic for you. So one thing that I always recommend is try to see, see the patient, not try, see the patient at least once a month for the next 90 days and try to create, even if they're not coming in to see you, create a system where you're communicating with them. Again, just to make certain that your records are, are, are clear and there's no question about what it is that you um, are deciding. So another um, big piece of advice that I give my, 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 cl my client doctors, and this one they're not crazy about, right? Because doctors at the end of the day are in the business of helping people. You cannot give every single patient that you evaluate an order 90 days from that date. It's hard for me to say that because, again, I'm not the doctor and I'm not seeing the patient and maybe there is some justification, but I'm going to tell you right now an easy way to create red flags for the Department of Health will be that every single patient that walks through your door gets a recommendation 90 days later, okay? And, and in truth, I find it hard to believe that every single patient would be eligible. And so I think that's an incredibly important um, guideline to go by in your office. So be selective about who you make these recommendations to. Another piece of advice that I give um, a lot of my doctor clients, in terms of a medical practice, I do think that it's a good idea to diversify the practice with other forms of holistic type treatment um, and medicine, whether it's based on some type of equipment that you have access to, that you know, you know, that you've gotten the proper certifications, um, whatever it may be. It's not a bad idea to create a practice around holistic medicine um, as opposed to a medical marijuana practice. And again, the reason why I do that is because I think that all, why I say that is because I think that it ultimately um, puts the doctor in the safest position possible, that they are not only in the business of ordering medical marijuana. Um, am I good on time? Huh? 
I think I've given you some pretty decent advice in terms of you know, how to run your medical practices. I want to close off with, I guess I'm a natural advocate at heart. Um, the next six months are so incredibly crucial in all of this for whatever reason you're in it for, okay? There are workshops that are being held all over the state. There's one, I think, on the 7th in Broward. Um, I'm certain that um, you know anybody here that's involved in the program can give you that information. They're rulemaking workshops where stakeholders are invited to come and give their um, suggestions or concerns about this particular industry. You need to get involved. You need to get involved, you need to be heard, so that at the end of the day, what gets generated is an industry that is obviously the first goal is to give patients access to medication, but also to allow a culture in this industry that, that permits economic growth in that respect. I think that those two things, um, it's, it's not impossible to balance those two things and balance it so, in a socially responsible way. And so at the end of the day, what I encourage all of you to do, whether you're a doctor or not, is to keep in mind the importance of being socially responsible with this. I always say that, unfortunately, Florida is the fraud capital of the United States. And this area right here is going to be prime real estate, okay, for that fraud to be committed. I think that if all of us invest in this in the way that I'm explaining it to you, I think our chances of having success and not having this taken out from under us and all the time and energy and money that's been invested in creating this industry, we really need to protect it. And so that's basically it. I really hope that you've enjoyed um, what I've spoken to you about and I encourage any, um, any questions in the future because <laughs> I don't think we have time for questions. Thank you.